you know, it, over time, like, it's interesting because like I did, I tried the lessons, it didn't stick. And then I came back around to it mostly because I loved like Jack Johnson, Jason Mraz, these artists that were very acoustic heavy. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to start to play those songs for people, you know, Coldplay Yellow, like the real, the real like, ooh, song. Yeah. This podcast is about you and your journey in music. And we'll talk about uh, the new music you have coming out. Yeah, I love that, man. So where, where are you based? Uh, Nashville, actually. We oh, just what part? Here. Uh, south by Franklin. Cool. Nice, man. Yeah, I got a buddy who lives just south of Berry Hill. Um, oh, cool. Yeah, and then I did a lot of my new album with uh, this guy, Gabe Simon, who lives in 12 South. Oh, rad. Okay. Very, mm -hmm. very cool. Very cool. Yeah, man. Yeah, I'm originally yeah. from San Diego, so I... Oh, okay. Totally so we're, different world we're, for me. <laughs> we're coastal neighbors originally. Yeah, I did read you're from L.A.? Yeah, born and raised, man. I'm I'm from El Rose and Vine. So um that's actually like one of the one of my favorite things about this new body of work I've got, uh, The Art of Letting Go, is I've got uh this song called Palm Trees that talks all about that and being from here and everything. That's so cool. That is yeah, so, not a, not many of us really from Southern you know California originally. They say that and then and then then everybody has these opinions. That's kind of what I address <laughs> in the song is everyone's like, not only do I not know anybody like you, but I already think I know everything about you. Right. And I'm you like, must surf and <laughs> do yeah, all these yeah, things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, San Diego's got it. So they're like, you, you oh, yeah. love breakfast burritos, man. <laughs> and you're yeah. like, do I? <laughs> like, yeah, like, I don't know about that. <laughs> yeah. You're like, look, I like a breakfast burrito from time to time. Okay. But I'm not necessarily saying it's my brand. Okay. Right, right. <laughs> well, what was it like growing up in LA? Um, sure, dude, different was, than San Diego. Well, I always say, I mean, as you know, I don't have a comparison point. So right. I love being from LA, but I also, um, you know, I, I can't imagine being from anywhere else because I literally can't imagine being from anywhere else because my brain can't go there. Mm -hmm. um, I think for me, like something that I recognized recently was that palm trees aren't from here. And most of palm trees you see in LA are not native to Los Angeles. Like the soil that they grow in is not normal for them. They're more of an inland desert Palm Springs vibe or Florida or other parts of the world. And so I was out, out at a bar. This is just my, my latest feelings on LA. Okay. Is I was out at a bar and a buddy of mine who's from Boston was like, man, you know what I gotta say? Like the most overwhelming thing about LA when you get here, cause he had just moved there like the week before. So he was like, dude, there are palm trees everywhere, like everywhere. Uh -huh. And I had never really thought about that because they just kind of were part of the thing to me. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Sure. And, and so I got like, of course, like very songwritery about that. And then I'm sitting at the bar while conversation carries on and I'm looking around and I'm realizing none of the people I'm sitting with are from here either, just like palm trees aren't. Uh -huh. And so the next day I had this session with my buddy Slim Dan who went to high school right around the corner from me. Like we're, we're from the same neighborhood. And I was like, dude, I know we just met. I know this is Zoom, but like we have to get real about where we're from today. We have to write a song called Palm Trees. And so I <laughs> kind of like got all my feelings out there because I think, you know, song, my songs are a safe space for me to do that. And then hopefully they help other people feel better by way of that. But mm -hmm. it's, it's cool because I feel like the answer to that question really lives in the song because, you know, it's like, everybody's got these presupposed notions about you. And what people don't realize is the LA person that they don't really like usually is not from here or from California. You know exactly. What I mean? There's exactly. someone who's come Some here transplant. and they've, yeah, they've donned this personality. And I've got no problem with that. But kind of what I get to in the song is, um, you know, I got to make room for more palm trees to grow. And like, I don't really see myself as one of these perfect, beautiful things that just creates shade and and, and, you know, like it, it's just kind of there. I kind of see myself as, as part of it. Maybe I'm more of like a shrub on the Griffith Park Trail. You know what I mean? So I got to make some room for the palm trees. That's that's kind of, that's my most recent hot take on LA. <laughs> I love that. It is so. funny that you bring that up because I moved to San Francisco for a while and I came back to San Diego with a buddy of mine that I grew up with and his friend who was mm -hmm. originally from San Francisco. And that's the first thing he said. He goes, dude, there are so many palm trees here. And I did like never really recognize that until he said it. I'm like, really? Oh, yeah, there really are a lot of palm trees around here. It's really overwhelming. And like, you know, like there's, there's, um, there's just like, there's like five different kinds and they all kind of are just, and so it was funny when we were shooting the video, I was thinking like, where is just, so I had, I had us go down Highland. We went to Elysian. We went to all these neighborhoods here that I knew were just like 
bam, 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 Rodeo, like, because it was a lot of <laughs> upward shots for the video. Uh -huh. So I was like, no, 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 guys, like Connor, the director, who's fantastic, had this whole like run of show. And then we were going to get from downtown to Santa Monica and just pick up a bunch of B-roll while I'm driving the car. We rented this like really cool 80s Beamer that like was very hard to turn and didn't have Bluetooth. <laughs> it was awesome. Nice. And it was kind of my dream alternate life, you know? And I, and so he had this whole route he wanted to take. And I was like, no, 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 dude, we're going to go here. And then we're going to go there. And the, everybody was like, dude, like, can you like do a voice in Google maps for us? Because like, I would much rather have Garrett be like, yo, 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 right after the left, you're going to make a right at the Burger King. And then you're going to see a gas station. Don't worry about that one. That one's too expensive. Go two more blocks. You're going to be fine. You know what I mean? Like that's yeah. kind of how I was doing the whole day. It was really fun. That is so cool. That, that's really funny. Did you, uh, you, well, you grew up in LA, obviously, uh, yeah. your parents, one of your parents is a musician. My, no, no, no. So neither actually, oh, um, okay. that's a, that's a common, uh, uh, I don't know if I actually said that or an interview said that one time or whatever, but yeah, no, my, um, my mother was in the film industry, which maybe is the, is entertainment by way of that. Okay. Um, she was a, a TV movie producer in the eighties and nineties and, um, won a Humanitas award and all these really cool things. She's, she's very, very, um, well-respected in that regard. My dad just kind of did a bunch of different jobs, whatever it took to keep us in the city while my mom was in between projects. Mm -hmm. um, and then growing up, he was, you know, in different businesses all over the place. But uh, yeah, no, born and raised here and, uh, and, and, you know, always been me, which is kind of an interesting thing with the name change, you know, it's like, yeah, kind of aging into that a little bit. Now just going by Nash. Yeah, yeah. well, you know, I'm Garrett Nash now. Garrett Nash without okay is yeah that, yeah so I, I was doing I was doing Nash, Nash and I think with like, a G yeah 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 Got it. and and well that's the thing right so like yeah. I've always been Garrett Nash and then when I started releasing music I was a DJ I started DJing when I was like 13 because I was so socially anxious even though I didn't know that was the phrase for that yet that when it came to school dances I was like well if I do that guy's job then I don't have to dance with those people that I'm really nervous about talking to. So I could just hide behind my little That's thing. an interesting in. I've never heard that before. Yeah. So <laughs> that's, that's how I started. And I love music, you know, like I was a massive Beatles fan and all this James Taylor and records. My mom loved Joni Mitchell and stuff like that, but nothing. No, I didn't make, I didn't play. I played a little guitar, but nothing crazy. So I started DJing and my dad was like, we got to make a, we got to make like a business card for you. And he was like, what do you want your like DJ name to be? And I was like, I don't know, G Nash. And he was like, wow, that's great. I love it. You know? <laughs> so, so then I like made, over time, I like got my Instagram that, and I got my Twitter that, and I got my SoundCloud that. So then when I was getting out of high school and college and I started to put college, when I started to put records out, um, that's just what the name was. I couldn't, and, and hate you. I love you just took off and I couldn't really do anything about it. So I didn't have a chance to say, Hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. I, I'm Garrett Nash. You know what I mean? So it's cool because I'm now taking this opportunity to, um, I think the last couple of years really put into perspective who I am and who I want to be in a public way. And, and the new music really reflects that. And uh, it's cool because, you know, it's where I started and it's where I'm going. And now the funniest part is the silent G thing was like the bane of my existence, right? Like everybody would be like, oh, it's, it's like Ganache, like, like, like the God. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Like that's like too much. I don't want to know. I and like they'd be like, oh, it's ganache, like the dessert. And I'm like, no, like not that, either. you know what I mean? So it's always annoying and, but more power to him. And I wrote it off for years. And now with Garrett, it's two R's, two T's, which has oh. already come up three times. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> like, I really thought, I thought it was over, you know what I mean? Like, and it's back, but it's all good. <laughs> That's funny. So you did uh, the, the DJ thing from 13 on and then when yeah, did you man. start writing, yeah. writing songs? Yeah, and I guess you're never really not a DJ as much of an eye roll as that comes with. But I feel like I always there's always this like yearning for me to like anytime a party comes up or a friend's wedding. I did a friend's wedding like last year and they went and they were like, you know, would you would you DJ it? And I was oh. like, sure, you know, sure. <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> it never really leaves you because it's it's such a freeing form of 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 creativity because you're just you're conducting the vibe i guess for lack of a better phrasing yeah you, know? you are and so i feel like you know and growing up too i really felt like that helped me get in touch with what i loved about music and um and and you know recognize wow why does this song work so well to you know why does martha and the vandellas heat wave get everyone moving mm -hmm. but you know this song that i love twist and shout by the beatles like it has like the oh it's the beatles but then it wears off you know what i mean so i kind of had to learn 
the flow of everything. And, uh, and I think that's kind of what schooled me in the production and the songwriting game a little bit faster mm -hmm. than some, and, you know, is it, for someone who doesn't like just start playing piano, you know what I mean? Right. Right. When did you start writing songs? I, I probably started writing songs. Well, if you ask my mom that question, it's a different answer, but <laughs> I think I started writing good songs when I was like 16. Um, and good is a, is a stretch. There was a lot of the use of the word just, which I'm now allergic to, you know, it's just a little thing that, you know, you can just say it's a little thing that makes me, you know. Um, but, you know, I, when I was a little kid, I had this routine I did where my mom would play uh, Soul Man and I had a cowboy hat and I called it my howdy hat. And I would put that on and dance around the room and change the lyrics up a little bit. So I guess technically I've been songwriting since I was like nine months old, okay. but not seriously. Um, and then I didn't really feel good enough about releasing songs until I was about 16. Um, there's a couple floating out there, Garrett Nash demos that I feel less weird about because I've seen Charlie Puth's old songs and, and they're pretty good. And I'm like, all right, we were on the same, we were on the same page at one point. You <laughs> okay. Know I mean? Okay. Um, when did, when you started writing songs, like 16, you said, did you start showing those to people anytime, like quickly after that? Or was that yeah, more somewhat. of a personal I, thing? I, um, I, I would play the records around and I play them for my mom mostly because I really trust her opinion and her ear and, and pretty much all of my songs I run by her in advance because I think she, she played cello when she was younger and she just has a really good understanding of music. So mostly I would just play them for my mom and she'd have some notes and then I'd go make the changes and then I'd just put them online. Um, but it was nothing ever that serious. So I, you know, I'd play them around for friends and stuff like that. And girls, you know, I wanted, I only ever wanted to learn guitar because my neighbor who was like my friend when I was way younger started taking guitar lessons and all the girls like loved him. Oh, and I was okay. so jealous of this dude and I don't want to throw him out of the bus but you know it, over time like it's interesting because like I did I tried the lessons it didn't stick and then I came back around to it mostly because I loved like Jack Johnson Jason Mraz these artists that were very acoustic heavy mm -hmm. and I wanted to start to play those songs for people you know Coldplay Yellow like the real the real like ooh song yeah yeah you know? um and I was probably terrible but I remember one time a, a, a friend of mine came over who I had this big crush on and I played Yellow by Coldplay on acoustic guitar and she was like filming it on her like little flip phone <laughs> and I was like ooh I like that feeling you know <laughs> like, I, yeah. was, I was probably like 14 <laughs> or 15 then so yeah <laughs> Yeah. That was the bug. You got the bug. I think point. that was the bug. Yeah. Now that I think about it, you brought <laughs> up a, a thing that's made me remember when the bug happened. I there you go. Cold like, play. Cold well, play covers. Shows, Put your phones away. You know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's funny. Did your career really start to move when you put out "I Hate You, I Love You"? Was that kind of like this yeah, turning? Yeah, yeah. I would say okay. like I had an EP and a couple covers out, um, and then uh, "Hate You, Love You" came out and. Um, you know, it, it, everything just kind of snowballed from there and that was all independent. And then I signed to Atlantic shortly after that. Um, mm -hmm. and it's, it's been a wonderful journey since I, I appreciate them riding with me over the last couple of years. And I'm super grateful to go into this next chapter with the art of letting go with them, you know? Very cool. Yeah. So, so before that you put, you said you put it on an EP and a couple covers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Did you just play those around LA or like how, what, um, what did it look like in the beginning of your career? Yeah. So I, I came um into the music release world as nash on soundcloud okay. um which was probably my favorite i'm partial but probably my favorite like distribution service since myspace at that point mm -hmm. um and i i just really found an easy kind of way to uh like release music and not have too much pressure on it which was my buddy Andrew is in the app space. He actually worked at Apple for a bit and now he's like building Venmo in Dubai. He's wow. like crazy. <laughs> and he he I mean, he was like my first like successful friend from high school. And one time we were talking about music and 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 my world cuz I was producing records for my buddies um and mutual friends of him and mine. And he was like, "You know, in in my world we have this theory called do it and drop it where you make the app, you get it up and update it." if you need to, right? Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, that's nice, you know? And, and, I, and then I realized if you just pay like 20 bucks a year for SoundCloud at the time, you could re-upload files as many times as you wanted to and it would keep your stream count. So, oh, so you could re-post the same song would keep, I uh, got you, yes. okay. So I was like, well, then why do I care how my mix sounds? If I put it up and I wake up in the morning and it sounds bad, I'll just fix it. Mm -hmm. And so that freed up the whole thing for me to a point where I didn't have to feel weird about any of it anymore. And I was able to just kind of make to make. 
Oh, wow. Yeah. And were people finding your songs on SoundCloud? Yeah, somewhat. I had a lot of support from a couple of different music communities on SoundCloud that were like essentially what evolved into like the YouTube video community and then into playlisters on Spotify. Um, and mm-hmm. they would like repost me a bit. Um, and I made some really good friends and, and connections in that world. And um, but it was all it was really all community. Like I never like paid people to stream my songs or fake sh- stuff or what. It was all very like people just liked it. And and I had I did one cover of Sugar Sugar that did like subpar. I did a cover of Coco by OT Genesis that did like OK. It had like 300,000 plays on SoundCloud. And I was like, hey, like, you know, like that's a lot. Maybe, <laughs> maybe that's my sound, you know? Yeah. And so then I had this idea to make three EPs and then I started putting those out and that was kind of how it kicked off. But it was all very progressive and natural. And I was mm-hmm. actually so discouraged after the release of the first EP that I drove Lyft for a couple of days um and was like yeah maybe i'm just gonna i was gonna go to law school and do that kind of thing and then it really just felt like with um my intention with olivia which was to develop her as an artist and then put music out and then kind of funnel every all all the fans that i had developed up till then over to her stuff um that was kind of my my position on that and then i put the song up on my page to get people to hear about her and then it just kind of launched for both of us and and i don't think either of us would change a single thing about that yeah wow okay so you were you did you be like become friends with her and just like what she was no, doing yeah so basically when i was on tour she um had covered my first original song called disposable and uh i um reached out to her and i was like dude this is really great i love it like i would love to um you know hear more from you or whatever and i see her in san francisco we're gonna play a show there if you want to come to the show she was like, yeah, totally. I was like, cool. Like, I'll put you on the list. Like, are you good to like, you know, for it's 21 plus backstage. Is that cool? And she was like, oh, I'm 15. And I was like, oh my God, you're <laughs> incredible. Like, this is like what, like her voice just blew my mind. And, and then in, in the grand scheme of things at 15 years old, that's like, you know, when Lord was discovered and things uh-huh. like the Billie Eilish, like things like that. So I, now, so at the time I was like, oh my God, like, you know, this is going to be incredible. So she came to the show, we took some pictures and it was all good vibes. And then like about a month later, she sent me a demo for Hey, She Love You and was like, hey, I wrote this, what do you think? And I was like, I think it's incredible and I'd love to work on it with you. So her and her dad came down and we cut the record and then I put my thing on it and that's how that went. Wow. And did it just kind of take off right away? Uh, Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, it was crazy. It was just like, I put it out and like, honest to God truth, like it just started streaming. and, And like, I think that, the streaming, I mean, play counting or whatever you called it on Spotify, mm-hmm. like, or on SoundCloud. Mm-hmm. Um, it just took off, man. And I, I'm, I, I'm so grateful that, uh, that it happened. And, and, you know, it's crazy. It was like five or six years ago now, which like, is like a 20th of an average lifespan. So it's crazy to even still be thinking about it. But um, I'm very grateful for it. It was obviously like a very like honest and, and personal record for both of us. So neither of us really like diving in on it very much anymore, I don't think. But um, I'm glad it happened. And and uh, I'm grateful for my life now with my cats and my dog and all that, you know? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, when when it started doing really well on SoundCloud at this point, like, is that opening doors for you or more people wanting to work with you? Or are you getting hit up by different labels and management companies like? Yeah. So um, I uh, started getting a lot of like unsolicited emails from really, really powerful people at labels. Um, and then I ended up meeting Craig Kalman. Um, and I just really appreciated his uh, outlook on the music industry and the way that he approached um, the process and the balance of business and professional. Um, him and Julie run a very, very tight ship. And I don't really like doing business, for lack of a better term, with people that I don't want, um, I, I, like, I, I, I have to want the person's job, or I have to like what they do so much that I want to mentor under them, essentially, because when someone that powerful works with me, uh, it's, it to, me, to me felt like a mentorship, and, and Craig is very close to me and always, you know, give advice and Julie's always there for me as well. And, and I remember telling him like, I want your job, man. Like, you, you know, this is cool. (laughs) You listen to new songs all day from all my favorite artists on earth. And like, you know, and I really feel like that was for me, there was a lot of wonderful people that reached out, but, but uh, I just, I felt at home at Atlantic and, and there's many different labels and wonderful places for people to work with. And I think what's really cool now is my partner, um, well, so I'm managed by my fiance, Rosabelle, and so she and I um, have just 
um, founded a label at Atlantic called Overall, which is the logo I'm wearing. Um, oh, cool. I'm, I'm a very proud, uh, proud partner. And um, I'm like the fun dad in r and she really does the tough stuff. And I think what's cool now is that we're in a position to start giving uh, opportunities that feel like family to artists that we find and we believe in or that find us. So it's cool that, you know, we're, we're starting the reciprocity process in the other way now. That is so cool. That yeah. is so cool. So where were you at when COVID happened and did that affect this new record at all? Or were you working on this record at that yeah. time? Yeah. So I, I had been working on it a bit um, and honestly thought that it would be wrapped up around June of last of 2020. Mm -hmm. um, and then obviously everything changed and I was at home and I did what I know how to do when I'm feeling things. And uh, I wrote 180 songs on Zoom um and wow. i've yeah and i've picked uh well i my team and i'm jeff who's my a and r jeff levin he's wonderful um my manager like i said rosabelle and i would sit down or zoom every three weeks and i'd play through all of the songs i'd written and then they'd pick one or two that would go in the album folder and then we said you know when we get to about 10 let's hit a pause so we got the first 10 mixed and then uh i went back in and wrote even more because rooms were starting to open up again because this was towards the end of the pandemic so mm -hmm. wrote a couple more with some close friends who i could like be like you're vaccinated right you know what i mean like yeah yeah, yeah. Um, felt and, safe um, with that person yeah exactly and and we i would like sit in the back corner over there and they would sit here or vice versa you know like very safe with all the windows open <laughs> and we wrote a, we wrote about five six more songs and then we picked two of those and that's how we put the record together and it, it came together so organically and so naturally and uh, again, it all just comes around to, you know, I, I had time on my hands and uh, and did what I know how to do. <laughs> Write songs, you know. Wow. Yeah. You said 180 songs? Yeah. yeah, about that. Yeah, it might be a little bit more now because I've written another two or three EPs worth of material since we finished the record. And the record probably won't even come out until middle of next year. So, oh, um, my gosh. Yeah. So I'm I'm. I had to take a new, I had to take a new perspective on anything. I have a mentor who's very important to me. And about six months before COVID, we had a conversation at a restaurant about, um, he, he said, I see your career going in one of two directions at this point. And he's very, very well esteemed in the music game. And, and he said, you can either tour your, your brain out and just go, 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 and play a million shows and get so well regarded in that department and keep escalating in venues and do that whole thing and put out records when you can or when you feel like it because you have time in between runs or you're running off to sessions or whatever, cutting on the bus or whatever. Or you can just write and just write and write and write and write and put it all out and see how that goes. And then every now and then play a couple shows. And I was like, I think with my cat and my life now and my avocado toast the way I like it and my tea at noon and all the things I like about my life, that sounds like my option. He's like, I know you very well. And that is what I'm telling you, you should do. And so then <laughs> I was just home. <laughs> I had no choice. So yeah. I was like, wow. I what he said. So I just kind of did that and it went really well. Yeah. What if you're like, yeah, I should do the touring thing. I mean, it's like, you totally. <laughs> totally. I mean, look, what an I've option done, to choose. Yeah. I'm, I've done, uh, three or four headlining runs at this point i've gone out on tour with great bands and artists that i love and respect and i'm i love touring because of the obvious direct human connection that you create with the people that love your music and it's really a chance for you know i get to share my vibration with my music all day long if you think about you know a sound wave as a vibration and then i'm putting that into a microphone with an emotion and then all that's carrying over and being recorded that's my turn to express myself. And I think what's really beautiful about a show experience is that you give that opportunity. Um, you create that moment for an opportunity for all these people that are all over the world to be able to come to your place and say, here's my vibration. Here's how that made me feel and give it back to me. And then that charges me up. And then I go back in here and I make more songs. So I am super grateful for the live aspect of my, of my career. And I'm really missing it and looking forward to getting back to it. But I also can't deny how productive I've been. And look, you and I may have a conversation in a year and say, he was right on with that. And I'm so glad you wrote so many songs and look at how well your career has gone. Or I could say, you know, I probably could have played a couple more dates, <laughs> but I'm going to do my best to get out there and feel, feel great about it when I do. And then I, I really think that right now it's just a lot of like 
anxiety about the what ifs of touring again, you know, like, well, what if people don't show up or what if this or what if that? And, uh, you know, I'm just trying to hold faith in the fact that my songs are really good and my friends all like them and, and my partner likes them and my parents like them. And um, we'll see how it goes. You know, <laughs> that's why I'm and at. millions, billions of people uh, have enjoyed listening to them as well. <laughs> the ones that are out already, you know, and well, I think I mean, like, that's that's always the scary thing with a new batch of tunes. I think any artist, any creative yourself, anybody that's ever done anything then has to say, OK, I got it. I'm going to do it not again, but I got to do it different and I got to advance the ball and I got to figure out a new way. You know, I'm sure your questions have changed from the first time you did these interviews to now and you sure. keep them progressing. And, and it, you know, I think for me, it's um, really as long as I keep being honest about whatever I'm feeling, then I think the songs will stay good because I trust that I surround myself with a lot of musicians and songwriters and producers who are a lot more talented than I am, who help me express those things and all I get to do. And it's a really cool job. I go in the room every day and I say, you know, what's bothering me today? Or, or you know, it's, it's something you can't get over. Like for me, I'm, I'm really deep in meditation. And I think like the, the, the things I end up writing songs about are, things that really are really bothering me when I meditate. Like, you know, when people say, when I meditate, I just can't clear my mind, right? Mm -hmm. Those things, the things that aren't clearing are the things I'll write songs about in hopes that that will therapeutically help me get it off my soul. Oh, um, that's interesting. Yeah. And I mean, Dan Wilson has another way of phrasing that, which I think is more colloquial and less spiritual. He says, you know, write, write a song about uh, a story that you tell a friend. And, you know, we all have those stories that we always are telling people. We're all mm -hmm. social people. So maybe someone cut you off or I'm supposed to have jury duty this week, for example. So a lot of my songs, because I've, I've been checking every night and they haven't called me yet. Tomorrow's my last day. So all week I've been thinking, like, is there a song in how anxious I am about maybe having to do jury duty? Because I don't really mind the idea of jury duty. Like, I'll go do it. I, my days are pretty chill. I can move my day around. I'm actually mm -hmm. an ideal candidate. But like the courtroom nature and the questioning and the this and the that and all that oh, yeah. and the music, but it's like look like if I'm meditating I can't get that off my head I may as well like write out a poem of it or journal it at least so I get those feelings down because once those feelings are gone or you've processed them or they're kind of in the back of your head they're just either going to live there and fester there or they go away forever and they carry on to somebody else's antenna you know mm -hmm. so I try and get the thought and the feeling down when I'm living it even if I don't write the song in that exact moment because the feeling will still be real when I do, because it'll still be there, you know? Right, you can um, still go back and reference it. Yeah, totally. And then that helps also, I'm doing a lot of songwriting for other people lately, which has started to go really well, um, and collaborate with other people. And I think something I encourage everybody to do when I'm working with them is just tell me however you're honestly feeling, because no one feeling in the feeling sensation inside our body is so unique. The cause for those feelings are all very, very unique. And, and I 100% respect that. But you know, if you tell me, you know, someone comes in and says, you know, I've just broken up with this person and it's tough because I'm, you know, I'm really in love with their dog and their dog is my favorite part of the relationship. And I really miss the dog. I can think, you know what? I, I love my cat. And like, I feel like maybe I can channel some of that and imagine what would it be like if me and Roosevelt broke up and I wasn't able to see my cat as much anymore. And then we have common ground and then we write the record. And I think that's really important in co-writing too, is conversational, communicative, honest expression always gets the best record for the people in the room. I could care less best record out in the world, but I want everybody to leave a session with me or a session at my house or in my environment feeling better than when they walked in, because I also want the listener to feel better at the end of the record than they did at the beginning. And the only way to make sure that that happens is that we did in the room. Mm -hmm. So I try to make sure that carries to the record so that then we can help the people out there with that same feeling, you know? Mm -hmm. I love that. Were you, yeah. did you record a lot of this record, the new one in, in the room you're sitting in? Right here. Yeah. So this is my little, this is my little SM7B I use. Oh, um, nice. I changed it up on this album. I used to use an Audio Technica 2020, which is like a $200 mic. So uh -huh. I doubled that. I got a $400 To the $400 one? Yeah, there you exactly. go. <laughs> um, and then I got a cloud lifter for that, which is a great little thing that you run it through that my buddies in Nashville told me about. Um, and then basically how I do it is I'd sit here just like this. I'd write a record with, let's say, Gabe in Nashville. And then he would put down a guitar track, send that to me. I would cut the vocal. I'd send that back to him. He'd work on it a bit, send it back to me. And the reason that I wanted to do it that way is because my favorite, my favorite album of all time and, and by way of that kind of artist is the Postal Service, who only mm -hmm. has one album. 
And the lore of how that was created, I don't know if this is true or not, but from what I've heard is that they basically sent reel to reel tapes back and forth cross country through the postal service. Yeah, through the mail, right? Right. Yeah. And so I was like, well, what's the digital version of that? You know, and that's kind of what I did with everybody I worked with. So I wrote a bit with Sam Harris, Max Ambassadors, and he and I worked that way. Oh, he's a um, great guy. I've, I've oh, interviewed amazing. him a couple of times. He's like amazing. one of the nicest people ever, especially for the stature. Dude, what a great songwriter. Status he has. Yeah. Oh, dude, incredible songwriter, incredible artist. I love his shows. I think he's amazing. His art is amazing. Like he, he's one of those people that when you're, when you're working with him and when you experience what he does live, he's, he, he's one of those people that gives every tiny cell in his body to what he does creatively. Mm -hmm. And I have the utmost respect to that because um, I don't always do that. And it reminds me that I should more, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. uh, like, you know, he even does like cool character voices when we're recording something to get different types of takes on a shout vocal. Does so, he really? Oh That's yeah, funny. it's so cool. It's so cool. So he'll we'll have a part, and it'll be you know, and a ba ba ba, and he'll go. All right, cool. Give me another one. He'll go ba 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 ba, and he'll do like three different ones, and then be like, all right, that one left, that one right, that one down the middle, and it'll create like a room of different people, and it'll do a real high one and a real low. One. It's like it's cool. He has all these characters. It's amazing. That's so funny. I didn't yeah. know that. I'm sure in his head he's got them named or something. I've never asked him, but it's sure. Really cool um yeah, cool. but yeah man yeah no so i did the whole record that way right here in the room um and just bought this fancy hd camera to so i look pretty my buddy jimmy robbins who's a songwriter had this cool camera and he looked amazing and i was like why do you look so good he's like i got this cool camera so I, I did this <laughs> there you go yeah w was that the first time you had written over zoom was over the last year and a half yeah and i was actually really really scared to do it for the first couple months and then a couple of my friends got me out of the woodwork with the pitch of dude we're in Nashville. You would have to come do a trip here to, to write. We'd have to write together that way. Mm -hmm. We have this opportunity. Let's see where it goes. And we ended up writing a bunch of records together for the album. So it worked out, you know? That's amazing. And yeah. the most recent song you put out, Super Glue. Tell me about that one. Super Glue is cool. So that one, um, so Danny and I, Slim Dan, who I, is on that record with me, he, um, like I said, is born and raised in LA. He's, he's who I wrote Palm Trees with as well. He's your so, or from the same neighborhood? Is that what you yeah, said essentially same yeah. high school, same neighborhood. Yeah. So he uh we only met over quarantine over FaceTime hang, and then we did a Zoom session and wrote Palm Trees the first day. We wrote a couple more times, and then he sent me that record and was like, dude, I did this the other day with this this songwriter Christina. Um, I think it's really great. You should check it out. And I was like, dude, this is sick, but like I don't understand how like there's certain melody parts in it that just didn't make sense to my voice, which happens all the time with pitch records, right? Like pitch mm -hmm. meaning someone pitches it to me. Right. Um, and there's, there's a couple ways to do pitches, but this was a very safe pitch because Danny's never going to be like weird if I like, you know, use the Say word it. super glue in another song. So I don't usually <laughs> listen to unsolicited demos, but if a friend sends it, I will. And otherwise it has to come through the channels, you know, manager. Oh, right? that makes sense. So yeah, so you don't get yourself into trouble. And yeah, like, oh, so, I sent you this and then you stole my totally, word. Totally, totally, totally. <laughs> and, and, and wow, my, I didn't think about how much you have to cover your own ass. Yeah, and my, I mean, I learned that from my mom because there's so much of that in the film industry of people coming in and being like, I've spent my whole life writing this treatment or script. And then, you know, she would watch these executives be like, oh, we'll change three things and eh. You know what I mean? And so right. I've yeah, had to be, I've had to be very cautious because I never want, I, you know, one of the greatest vexes of my life is that I never want anybody to like feel like I've done something wrong or anything like that. And I feel like, uh, you know, that's such an easy place to mess that up. So I, mm -hmm. I avoid it. But with Danny to get around to it, he um, he basically was like, dude, I wrote this record. I was like, dude, I love it. I can't sing it. Let's move on. And then Jeff, my A&R was like, you know, with these songs coming out from the album, like let's put out palm trees, but then we can't just go silent until we put another single out. He was like, we have to stack around your world a little bit and make, show the world what your universe looks like. He's like, you have all these amazing songwriter friends, all of these really talented people in your life, put records out with them and let's show your universe off as opposed to trying to force you into pockets of people that you'll just have social anxiety about being around anyway, you know? <laughs> so so the so then I, I was like you know like it'd be great if Danny had an artist project and he's like what do you mean like I just heard this song from him it's amazing and I was like all right great so he put out the song MVP which is really great and then I hit him and I was like dude do you have anything that that um you think we could do together or should we jam on it he's like well we have this one that you said was not right for you to sing and I was like all right perfect so then we've made it work together and we put it out 
Um, and you know, I changed like three words and felt my ego was inserted in the record and we moved on. <laughs> there you go. Is that going to be on the album or no? Is it just uh, different... probably not? No, okay. it's more just a fun song. I think a lot of the, the, a lot of the stuff that I'm doing with the friends leading up to the record is going to be peppered around the record, but not actually part of the album. But mm -hmm. you, then again, who knows, right? Especially in a label situation, if that song just suddenly starts doing a hundred million streams a day, it'd probably be to my advantage to put it on the record and find a way to excuse yeah, it. So I would say we'll figure it out, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah time will tell i love it yeah think, exactly and you decided to go uh garrett nash in this record was there yeah. like a why do you have a reason for that or just you came i think i think it'll make a lot more sense when people when more of the songs are out but i think palm okay. trees is a really good example of why i did it i think that um like i said earlier i never really had a chance to say whoa 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 i'm garrett nash and a lot mm -hmm. of my favorite artists at about this point in their life get to make that decision um as to what they want to be called moving forward and for me, I've always been Garrett Nash. I've, it's, it's, you know, how I was named as a child and I grew up <laughs> into it. And if anything, I butchered this perfect name that my mom came up with. And so um, I'm excited to associate that with these honest and, and true and very real stories from my own personal life. You know, there's there's songs that aren't on the record that are literally the name of the street I grew up on and stuff like that. It's, it's just very, very, very honest. And um, mm -hmm. I think that, you know, just over the last couple of years, there's a lot that's been called into question with with my um, identity amongst myself and me saying who, you know, I'm, I'm I call myself into question. And I say, Garrett, are you are, you know, what do you want to stand behind? Who are you? And all these types of questions, because in songwriting it's extremely introspective and you end up kind of living in that space, sometimes till a, de a depressive point. And so I think a lot of that for me was saved by like, I don't want to keep trying to live this facade of Garrett Na of Nash when I could be existing as Garrett Nash and then associating these records with those things. Um, I think it was really a personal thing. I convinced myself that Nash was something that um, was a lot more complicated than it needed to be. And when I started writing these less complicated records from a place of real, real, pure, true honesty, not saying in the past I haven't, Hate You Love You, very honest, Broken Hearts Club, very honest, a lot of yeah. these records, very honest. But when in this time where I was just by myself in my room, it really made me gut check myself. And so that's where the name change came from. Um, and the label suggesting it and hearing these new demos and saying, hey, I think we should do this, you know, mm -hmm. which was cool because it was something I had been thinking about. And then they suggested it. And I was like, yeah. perfect. I've been thinking validated about it. what you were. I trust, thinking I trust, anyway. Yeah, I trust that the, the best answers come from the people that you trust the most. And mm -hmm. usually that's coming from even beyond them, you know, it, mm -hmm. on a spiritual front. And uh, so I trust when something like that comes across the line, I should listen to it. Definitely. definitely. Yeah. Well, Garrett, thank you so much, man, for doing this. I appreciate your time. Oh, yeah, man. Absolutely. I really appreciate you, too. And I'm excited to uh, excited to watch it. I've, I've seen a bunch of these interviews and I'm stoked to watch this one. Awesome. Say, oh, you, you shouldn't have talked about your cat peeing for so long. <laughs> <laughs> I have one more fast question for you. I want to know if you have any advice for aspiring artists. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, I think it kind of goes back to what I talked about earlier with the do it and drop it mentality. I think like you know, whatever your personal beliefs are or your spiritual or meditation beliefs or whatever they are, I would say find oh, find something that helps keep you sane and reduces your anxiety because this is a very, very unforgiving and confusing world to enter yourself into um, because you are putting yourself on a public pedestal with your most deep rooted and emotional and sensitive thoughts and feelings. So find something that you do that you love to treat yourself, whether that's a hobby, you make pottery, you go to a garden and meditate once a week, you drink a bunch of water, you make coffee in the morning, whatever it is for you. And then beyond that, when it comes to releasing records, just get songs out. And then when people are listening, you'll know, and then start to think about it a little bit more and be strategic. But don't sit on records so long because you're afraid, oh, what are people going to think? This isn't the right first song, whatever. Most of my favorite artists, I have no idea what the first song they were that, that they put out ever was. I had no idea what Death Cab's first single was. I don't care because I love Death Cab as an artist forever. You know what I mean? So I think don't let that stuff get in the way and just trust your gut and trust I'm making these songs. I want to put them out or don't. But don't let the public perception get in the way. The great other is what Roosevelt calls it. Don't let the great other bother you because they're not going to be with you when you feel sad and they're not going to be with you when you feel happy. So just put records out that you love and then, and you'll build a fan base. Everything will be fine. Um, but don't, don't, don't let all those insecurities get in the way best you can. And then find something that you do that you love that you can treat yourself to from time to time. And uh, hopefully that's a non-destructive habit. <laughs>